Welcome to the Wasm Assembly podcast, your monthly gathering of people to geek out about all things WebAssembly. I'm your host, Thomas Steiner, a developer relations engineer on the Chrome team. And with me today is Alan Zakai, a staff software engineer on Google's Wasm team. Thanks for joining me, Alan. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show, and uh, thanks for being the very first guest of the show. Um, so, Alan, I guess most people on the internet know you as the inventor of Mscripten and by your handle, Kripken, um, that you use everywhere on GitHub, on Twitter, on your homepage. Um, do you mind telling us what it means, where it came from? Uh, yeah, so it's it's just kind of a silly uh, uh, philosophy joke. There's a philosopher called Kri called Kripkenstein, and or rather a philosopher called Kripke, and there's a joke about him, there's an interpretation that some people felt was kind of changing his the meaning of what he said to something else. So they call it a sort of Kripkenstein thing, where it's kind of like Frankenstein. Anyway, so that struck me as funny back in the day, and for some reason I used it as my GitHub and handles el elsewhere. It's really just a meaningless joke. <laughs> it's very, very unique. So that's a good one. Um, if you want to search for Kripken, that's definitely just you that pops up. Cool. Um, so yeah, Alan, you joined um, Google in 2018. And before joining Google, you worked at Mozilla. And um, in your LinkedIn bio, and I'm reading this, uh, it says, I'm an expert at compiling code, especially C++, to the web. And then in parentheses, HTML5, WebAssembly, JavaScript, WebGL, and making the result fast and compact. I created or co-created several of the important standards and code bases in that space, including WebAssembly and Mscripten. So boy, <laughs> that's quite the bio there. Um, can you tell us about those early days of ASMJS, where WebAssembly wasn't a thing quite yet, but Binarian and Mscripten already existed, but like didn't compile to WebAssembly quite yet because, well, it wasn't a thing yet. So how did all these technologies come together back then? Yes, yeah, so I think it's an interesting history in that, yeah, for well over a decade, there was a need for a way to compile native code, typically in C or, 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 or C++ to the web. And there was not really a good way to do this before uh, before WASM, obviously. So there were a bunch of things that made it possible, like NACL, and there was also a way to do it using Flash. So NACL, na native client in Chrome back then? Yes, native client in uh, Chrome. Yes, and Flash had a technology, I believe the compiler was called CrossBridge, and it also had a way to compile to it. Uh, but there were significant downsides in them because of the feasibility of standardizing them, portability, stuff like 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 that. So it was just difficult to to see a path forward for them. And back in the day, I was just doing it as a hobby project. I had a game engine that I wanted to compile to the web. So I ended up going down this path of seeing, well, how hard would it be to compile LLVM to JavaScript? Because JavaScript was a full standard that ran everywhere. And uh, yeah, so I basically started Mscript and with that goal. And that was really just, I guess, lucky to be in the right time and, and place that, that, that there, were, there were a bunch of other people that were also interested in compiling similar things to the web. And at Mozilla, eventually that led to the SMJS project where, uh, so this was Dave Herman, Luke Wagner, and my, myself, that there was sort of a way to define a subset of JavaScript that could be more easily optimized. So it was still compiling to JavaScript, but it was kind of this thing that the browser could do better. And it ran, but obviously it was still kind of a hack because it compiled to JavaScript. But it showed that a lot could be done using JavaScript. It could be pretty fast. And, and that, that, I think, was one of the things that led to WebAssembly, and that it was kind of a good proof of concept. You might say, and it and it seemed like the most feasible thing to standardize. That is to make something that's portable and that can work in all browsers. So mm -hmm. that's I think sort of the prehistory of of Wes, or at least part of it. There's also quite a lot to say about native client and other other things in this space. You know, there's quite a lot of detail. 
So would it be fair to say that gaming was what initially um, was the trigger for you starting this project? You mentioned the game engine. Was that Banana Bread? I found that during some doing some research. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so for me it did actually start just because I happened to be interested in game engines at the time, and I had a game engine that I was working on, tinkering with, and I wanted to run it. To, yeah, it happens that games were a lot of the initial interest in both SMGS and WebAssembly and native client. Yeah, I guess just because these are very demanding applications that need very fast CPU execution. So yeah, they, they need something more than sort of typical JavaScript execution speed. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned standardization before. So um, there was obviously Flash around. Um, there was NACL. There was PNACL. Um, what did the P stand for? Um, I forgot. Was it Portable NACL? Um, so was there, like I guess for, for Flash, the question didn't arise, but like was there ever an effort um, on standardizing NACL, PNACL, like these Chrome-only plugins? Uh, I believe so. So the goal... So, so I wasn't at, at Google at, at the time. All I know is what, what I've heard externally. But I, I feel that the goal was to try to standardize it. It was to prototype the technology, to prove it out. And it was really a very impressive te 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 technology, really fully sandboxed, and that you could just run things really at native speed in a much more obvious way than something like SNJS that depended on JavaScript. And my understanding is that the goal was to implement this prove it out in Chrome, and then try to standardize it. Uh, I feel it could have potentially been standardized, but there were a bunch of issues. For example, Pinnacle used the Pepper API as its API for doing things on the web for audio, graphics, etc. And there were a bunch of difficulties in standardizing that. One of the advantages of SNJS and WebAssembly was that it in the end, just used existing web APIs. It didn't duplicate the API surface of the web, basically. Mm -hmm. So some of our listeners might come in later and they might never have heard the term ASMJS. They just might have uh, started with WebAssembly from the beginning. Um, can you just summarize very briefly what ASMJS was? And I, I said it wrong in the beginning, ASMJS. So ASMJS is how you pronounce it correctly. Yeah, so I mean, that's at least how I say it. I actually, I don't remember if Dave and Luke always pronounced it the same way. Probably we all did. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, so what, what, what was it? So kind of a formally specified subset of JavaScript. And I don't remember who came up with the name. It definitely wasn't me. So either Dave or Luke. And I'm guessing the idea was it's like ASM for assembly, so very low, low level. And it was actually a sort of a type sy system that defines a subset of operations. So, for example, if, if in JavaScript you do X plus Y, you just add two things. Well, those could be numbers, they could be strings, they could be objects. So, in SMGS, to get around that, you would do something like X plus Y or zero. And so if, you've, if, if anyone ever looks at SMJS output, you'll see all these or zeros. And the or yeah. operator yeah, in JavaScript, it just coerces the input to a 32-bit number. And it turns out that the semantics are exactly what, what you want. Even if you add two doubles and then do or zero, it's the wrapping, the two's complement, it all works out. So you can just implement it as a 32-bit integer add. So kind of defines a subset of JavaScript that has fully optimizable integer and float math operations. And then you can get very, very close to the speed that you want when you compile a native application. So would it be fair to say that ASMJ has sort of um, added type safety in a sense of that the uh, um, that the compiler, sorry, the interpreter uh, can assume that um, an integer is an integer is not and uh, not possibly a string or something, um, so that it just adds these guarantees, if you will. Yeah, really. I mean, that, that that's really a good way way to put it. Yeah, it's using these annotations, these or zeros. You're basically proving that the types are what they should be. Yeah. If in ASMJS we have an add function. Um, you have A plus B, you have this trick where you OR zero to it, so it can be sure that it's an integer, which then allows the uh, interpreter to um, yeah, just have the type guarantee so it can optimize the code and run faster. So 
with the view of today, we have a TypeScript, obviously, where you can just say in the function body, um, whatever function add, um, a plus b, and you then just say a and b are integers. So you don't need the trick of oring zero dynamically anymore. You could just say, um, yeah, something is an integer to begin with. Um, so if we take um, this technology and put it back uh, in time so that it existed when, when you were working on ASM.js, would this have allowed you to uh, come to similar optimizations? Yeah, that's very interesting to think about. Uh, maybe we really would have used TypeScript if we'd had it at the time. I think you're right. So I imagine we would have done something like compile to TypeScript, maybe TypeScript augmented with types for float. The 32, 64, and 32, and 664, uh, SIMD. Basically, we made sure we had the right types, but then we would have used TypeScript notation to just define the types in the normal way. And then I suppose added, if we needed any infrastructure in TypeScript, in the TypeScript compiler to do that. But it would have been a much friendlier format for people to read if it were basically like TypeScript, but maybe with a few more types. Yeah. So yeah, that could have been an interesting path. Things could have gone down if we had Back to ASM.js, um, so the OR0 was a common trick, um, but I also see a lot of um, like typed array operations there. So can you explain a little bit why these made um, this ASM.js run faster than regular JavaScript? Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, so there's really two core things to the speed. One is the types, as you said, to make sure that integers are integers and of the right size. Uh, the other thing is that when you compile code from language like C or Rust or th that sort of family of languages, they all assume this very simple idea of memory that really is just sort of a single big array. So you do things like malloc and free, and you just get offsets in this effectively array. So in Watson, we call it linear memory. And the way to do that in SMGS was to just use a typed array. So whenever you allocate an object in C++, C++ you get a little region of this big typed array that belongs to you, and then you just write and, and read from it. So you represent sort of the native machine's memory using a typed array. And it has to be a typed array because you need properties like aliasing. You need to be able to write a 32-bit integer and then read an 8-bit integer from the middle of it, which is harder to do if you had, say, an array of 32-bit integers, sort of a normal JavaScript array, not a typed array. So, so yes, mm -hmm. it's sort of a key part say, of, of being able to not emulate, but sort of execute code the same way that native code does. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to all of these uh, old um, blog posts on the Mozilla Hacks um, blog, and we will link those in the show notes, um, it's essentially a lot of um, support in the sense of, yeah, it's just a subset of JavaScript, so all browsers support it. But then um, people talk a lot about um, actual support in the engine. So for Mozilla, this is uh, a spider monkey. Um, for Chrome, this is uh, the 8. And then we have uh, Chakra back in the days um, when we still had um, the Edge uh, browser as a separate uh, independent uh, engine. We have uh, JavaScript core in um, WebKit. So support for ASM.js essentially was triggered by this uh, ASM.js string or use ASM.js uh, string. Um, so what, what sort of execution mode did this particular string trigger? Yeah, so it was, it was kind of the hint that the engine can can probably try to consider the code as SMJS. So it didn't have any semantic effects by itself. So it's different than, say, use a strict, which actually does change the semantics of JavaScript. It, it had absolutely no effect. But when an engine that wanted to optimize SMJS saw it, it could use that as a hint to actually start the process of checking if the code is valid S and JS, which does take some effort. So you don't want to do it on anything. So it was really just a hint in that sense. So you couldn't technically trick it. So you could just put the string somewhere 
Um, but if you had not written your uh, JavaScript in actual ASM subset of JavaScript, um, you would not get magic uh, faster executing code, right? Yeah, in general, it didn't help. You really would uh, would have to emit the exact type system of, of ASM.js, and writing that by hand is quite hard. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't imagine that many people did it. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a compiler output target, basically. So it's not like pressing the turbo button on these old PCs. <laughs> Okay, cool. So um, researching um, this episode, um, I found one of your old talks. Um, and I think it's only on uh, the archive.org uh, website where you can still access it. And in there, you wrote WebAssembly equals ASM.js done right. So how did we get from ASM.js to WebAssembly? So in one of your decks uh, that you presented, I actually saw this presented as a hack where he said, um, we have C++, we compile it with MScript to ASM.js, and then we have this ASM.js that we then compile to WebAssembly with ASM2 WASM. So it's like, wait, <laughs> there's like steps in between to finally get to WebAssembly when ASM.js still was a thing and WebAssembly was about to become a thing. So just can you tell us about this? Uh, like, how did we get there? How did we get from ASM.js to WebAssembly? Yeah, yeah, so there's maybe two, two, two stories that are interesting here. One is how did we get there on the standard side? And the other is how did we get there sort of on the tool chain side, on the technical side? It, so maybe briefly on the tool chain side, because it's shorter. Yeah, so the tool you mentioned, ASM to WASM, that compiles ASM.js to WebAssembly, came from just the technical need in, in sort of this this time in between as we were still standardizing WebAssembly, but we already had working tool chains that compiled code to ASM.js. So just a quick way to get a compiler to WASM by just compiling the ASM.js to WASM. So, so we had a tool there. So it kind of, I guess, is a stepping stone along the history of the technologies by going up from ASM.js to WASM. And that also, I guess, mirrors the standard side, which, which again, yeah, we had SMJS as a technology that worked, but it was it had many downsides. The code size is large, it's, it's a hack, it's hard to add features to, it wasn't fully optimized in all browsers. So there was just this interest in standardizing among, among really all the browser vendors, something that just does this properly can be more obviously correct, more easy to make efficient is a binary format, so it downloads in a smaller form. And uh, yeah, so there was just a lot of interest in doing something along those lines. And to be honest, I was skeptical whether it would happen, but really there was just enough of the motivation among all the vendors to get it done. I would maybe just one or two things to add to that. I think there was good timing and good luck around in the sense that there were things like the situation with Flash, which browser vendors were worried about its portability and safety because it was a closed source code base. They didn't do it. That wasn't part of their own code that they controlled. So there was this interest in using a more standard te technology to solve the use cases there. So Flash obviously helped make a lot of cool things possible, but these downsides were troubling. So there were a few use cases like running games on the red, running Flash in a safer way that motivated a technology like WebAssembly. And I think that that is part of the reason why really all browser vendors came together and it worked out a spec for it. WebAssembly is a very academic topic. Um, one of the things that I was wondering is you had um, ASM.js, so you could measure the speed of it. And then you had um, wasm.js, which is an interpreter of WebAssembly written in JavaScript that would run what would become WebAssembly. So it was doing the right thing, but just um, sort of in software uh, emulated, if you will, which eventually would be done um, like natively by the browser. Um, how did you, with this like poor person solution, if you will, um, how did you make sure that the assumption that you had when it, when it comes to um, speed might uh, make the effort worth uh, to actually build it and uh, yeah, just not implement it uh, in software on in user land, but actually make it a browser thing. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it is tricky, as you said, so sometimes when you 
when you prototype something, yeah, you can't really see the full speed at the end. Uh, yeah, so I think part of it was there was high confidence that it could be run at full speed just from the data we had about SMGS in general and just from first principles that we knew we were representing the same types that CPUs have. Uh, so there, there was that on the one side. On the other side, we had all these things that helped us get there, but yes, we couldn't rely on them for speed. So there was definitely a period in the WASM standardiz standardization process where we were kind of waiting for engines to fully implement it in order to measure that uh, speed. And there was just no re replacement for that. It just had to be measured in multiple engines to confirm that all the good reasons we had for thinking it could be fast were actually valid. Uh, yeah, so there were tools that helped in the middle, but they were certainly not enough, and just real measurements are criti were critical. I remember in the beginning, um, when I read all these old blog posts, um, Chrome was uh, slower than Firefox. Um, do you know where we are today? You know, I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Uh, so there, there was kind of this friendly benchmarking competition earlier. And there seems to be less of it now that might just be because everyone is so close to native speed anyhow. So yeah, I, I, I don't know that anyone is actively tracking this as an important thing. I, I certainly haven't measured it myself for, for a few years. When you say close to native, um, all the blog posts mention um, it's about half uh, the speed of native. Is this still where we are today or um, are we faster than that. Yeah, so I think the half the speed of native was really when WASM launched. Uh, we had a bunch of data along that. Uh, yeah, so it's really gotten faster since then. Uh, you will see a range depending on what, what you're doing. But in most applications, it can be just 10, 20% slower than full native speed. Uh, just when you're running code that fits well to WebAssembly. There are things that are run more slowly, like if you're using very custom SIMD, uh, which really is tailored to a particular CPU that will run into portability issues. And there are certain code patterns like large interpreter loops that we know as and is a little worse at. We don't exactly how much, but, but yeah, but it, it, overall, it's very close to native speed, often within like the distance of GCC and the clan to C compilers. They also have often 10, 20% differences between them. So yeah, we see such small differences between the, the, the VMs because I think they're at least on good code that compiles well, just run so close to native speed anyhow, in my experience. Talking about um, WebAssembly being an academic uh, topic of research. So coming into this uh, area, I was actually quite surprised to see how academic it was. Um, so my background is in computer science, and uh, I remember my professor in university always looking down on software engineering. I was like, these are just engineers. We do research, and like we are proper computer scientists. But like WebAssembly, I feel it's it's both. So it's uh, really serious computer scientists' uh, work, but also it's very serious um, software engineering work. And I'm um, looking at one of the papers, like the uh, two th 2017 paper, bringing the web up to speed with WebAssembly. Um, it has contributors from all major browser vendors back then. Back then. So it has Google with uh, V8 as the engine, Microsoft as Chakra, we mentioned that before, Mozilla with SpiderMonkey, Apple with uh, JavaScript Core. So it feels like, whoa, this is world peace uh, academic research. All the browser vendors come together, work on one thing. Um, do you remember how this collaboration went? And I think 2017, this is where you still were at Mozilla. Um, you're with Google since 2018, I guess. So do you remember how, how this, how this collaboration was? You said a friendly competition in the beginning sometime. Um, like, was it, was it always friendly? Yeah, I, I think it really was very friendly. And I was very impressed by that during the process. Uh, there, there was, this, this may come down to the personalities of the people that were uh, involved, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, so on the JavaScript side, before that, there were certainly around, I don't know, 2010 or so, there was the JavaScript speed wars and there was a lot of competition and people published a lot of posts with numbers. But in the West of Standards process, there was more of a collaboration to get to sort of this state of 
we just want to get to native speed and we need to figure out the best way to do it together as a standards body. So yeah, I don't feel there was much competition or stuff there. It was really a very, very good process that went well. And, and yes, as I said, it, it, it involved both engineering and academic research to get there, which is, I think, another good example of something that WASM has sort of integrated in a successful way that, uh, that honestly, I, if, you, if you had asked me in 2013 to predict if it would happen, I would have been too pessimistic. So it worked out better than I expected, really. I have another uh, prediction question, actually, Anna. This is like, would you have predicted um, for WebAssembly uh, polyfilling becoming re relevant again in 2024? And the background there is, um, if you have an iOS device and you put it in lockdown mode, it turns out the Safari browser disables WebAssembly. Um, so there's a project called PolyWASM that sort of redoes what WASM.js way back in the days did. It allows you to just run um, WebAssembly interpreted by uh, JavaScript. Um, like, would you have pre pre uh, predicted that this could be relevant again, um, like all these years later, when we really have all the browsers supporting WebAssembly since since uh, years? Yeah. So first of all, I, I I missed this in the news. That's very interesting. Uh, that 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 we need a project to sort of polyfill WASM in that way. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Luckily, WASM is not too hard to interpret and execute. So I guess that makes projects like these possible. You can also, I guess, just yeah, compile to JavaScript one of the existing WASM interpreters. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised that there's a need for it, but at least it's practical and possible to, to fix in that sense. Uh, I do know that there is some effort to sort of improve safety by disabling JITs, but but yeah, but a browser could ship an interpreter for both JavaScript and WebAssembly. So it seems like both could be supported equally in that sense. Yeah, so I don't really uh, have an insight into the security background there, but uh, yeah, this is uh, definitely something that uh, has to do with uh, security, why they disable um, WebAssembly. And I think even JIT uh, actually in, um, lockdown mode. Um, I'm not sure how many people have activated it, how relevant it is, but um, it's apparently important enough for someone to um, build this module. And um, that now pops up quite prominently if you search for um, WebAssembly polyfill. And um, yeah, obviously um, there was this uh, Binarian um, project, wasm.js, that did it before. Um, but it would be would be probably interesting um, for you as the as the person who've been there um, to just look back and see and compare the the approaches now and uh, back then. Um, yeah, so I want to go to uh, get to one more uh, topic in uh, this episode, which is um, canvas rendering of applications. So one of the things that I saw early on people do was um, they took, for example, uh, KDE applications from Linux that are built uh, against Qt. Um, or actually cutie, uh, I learned the proper pronunciation, cutie is what uh, the cool kids say, uh, apparently. So they compiled cutie to um, ASM, uh, ASM.js, so I'm struggling with uh, being a cool kid today. So ASM.js, so they compiled cutie to ASM.js, ran it. Um, they had all these uh, cool applications that were written originally for KDE on Linux, and um, they managed to run all of those in um, like the earliest days of ASM.js, so before WebAssembly, um, on a canvas rendered, um, pr pretty usable actually. And um, now, of course, we have uh, frameworks like Flutter that make use of Lasm GC um, to yeah get the full speed of Dart um, for canvas rendering applications. Um, we have Kotlin multi-platform, so that's probably the topic for an, for another uh, episode. But, like we have all these frameworks to do it today again, um, and they render all these applications um, on a on a canvas and um. I'm interested in, in hearing, like, back then when people did this for the first time, um, what did people think of this? Like, uh, it's pretty revolutionary compared to um, the traditional approach of, uh, you know, building a DOM and having JavaScript that uh, powers the, the logic of, of your apps and so on. So this is completely different. Like, your entire application is just uh, a canvas element um, compared to DOM, where initially it's a diff element, but then React or whatever framework fills it with actual HTML. So what, what was the early um, uh, community's reaction to those apps? Yeah, I think there's an interesting history there. I remember in the early 
days when it first when some of these first things came out, there was controversy, and I think for a good reason because the accessibility of these projects is limited. Uh, yeah, the browser doesn't have visibility into the DOM nodes, and it can't annotate them or do various things to translate the elements. Uh, so it certainly has downsides, but it also there are just use cases that require rendering to a canvas. Like if you're compiling a game, the game engine has its own UI. There's just often no way to render that using the DOM. It just wouldn't look the same, but the point of the game is to look the same on every place that you run it. And things like Qt, uh, you said is the proper way to say it. I was told that's the way to say it. Like I always said Qt. So, so yeah, so I mean, I think something like that is in some place in the middle. There are cases where it just makes sense to do. You have an important application that runs today. You have, I don't know, it's a business application. You just want to run it on the web. Compiling it to a canvas is, is the right thing. But ideally, people would write a web a UI that properly uses all the web APIs. So there's kind of these two separate use cases. And there's certainly some tension between them in terms of accessibility, performance, and different situations call for di different ones. Uh, but yeah, Wasm has enabled sort of this canvas rendered application use case, which before I think was quite rare. So yeah, with its upsides and downsides, it's, it's more of some, something that, that the web needs to, to deal with today one way or, or the other, I think. So you mentioned gaming, and um, some of the early demos that we saw were the Unreal uh, Engine compiled to ASM.js and then WebAssembly later. Um, so I think this was Unreal Engine 3. Um, I don't see many games anymore that um, like really blow my mind on the browser. So it seems like all these uh, like Quake, uh, whatever, Quake 3 Arena and so on, um, games that we saw on browsers and um, People were, were mind blown that this is possible. Um, like, I don't see those demos anymore. Like, am I just not looking at the right spots? Is it uh, like, where, where are we with, with gaming and WebAssembly? Um, I know obviously WebGPU is, uh, is taken over, um, but like, where, where are WebAssembly games? Yes, I think it's a combination of two things. One, this does exist, but yeah, you do need to, to know where to look. There are definitely people that port game engines, uh, the, uh, for, for example, Unity and the Godot game engines have ports to the web that they that definitely they have a lot of users that find useful and many, many others. So this does exist, but you are right that there, there was sort of in the history of this tech, there were many of the early demos were games, and it seems to hear a lot less about that now. And I think there's two explanations for it. One is just I think a lot of a lot of games apparently moved to phones and tablets, so maybe that's part part of it. I'm not 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 an expert on that that, that area, but another is you mean as native applications on yes. the, on phones? Yeah, mm -hmm. most people play native applications on their phones, so there's less of a need to to run them on the web. Uh, unfortunately, from my perspective, as, as someone that would prefer these things ran on the web, which is more portable. But yeah, but but the other side of it is that so. It, it is true that the early demos of much of this tech was in the game space. But I think from the beginning, many people were, were saying that games were an important proving ground for these applications because they have these high CPU dip, dip demands. They, they have all this native code that must be just compiled. We can't expect people to rewrite millions of lines of, of, of code. So important applications you see running on the web today using WebAssembly, like, like Photoshop, Google Earth, they're not games, but they're similar to games in that they're these large code bases that really need full speed. So proving WASM through games has sort of led us to be able to run this large class of important applications today, even if games are less prominent uh, right now. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much, Alan. Um... A lot of very, very cool insights. And um, this brings us to the last part of the show, where I always ask uh, guests two BASM but not questions. And um, let me explain how it works. So um, the first question is on, wait for it, um, instantiate stre streaming. So the question is, when you instantiate streaming on any of your streaming devices, 
what do you commonly listen to or watch? So, for example, for me, as a dad of, uh, of three kids, this mostly means, um, yeah, watching whatever they watch. So typically it would be some sort of animated movie on Disney Plus or, or Netflix. Like when you instantiate streaming, what is, what is it you watch or you listen to? Yeah, so a lot is comedy. Actually, right now I'm very much enjoying the last season of Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is sadly on its apparently last season. I think the finale is actually this this weekend. So yeah, I definitely like that. Uh, and actually, just on another to topic, one thing as a recommendation, uh, you just mentioned a animated shows that make me think of this. The show I'm probably enjoying the most right now is this animated show called The D Delicious in Dungeon, which is a Japanese animated show about basically a Dungeons and Dragons style dungeon, but it's just a lot of fun and very cleverly done and cleverly thought out with the characters and the setting. So if, you know, if anyone likes fantasy, I think it's a lot of fun. I'll put that on my list. Um, so talking of fantasy and talking of uh, binarian, so one of the random facts that I learned, learned recently is that it's apparently named after Game of Throne, Thrones. So you're also a big uh, Game of Thrones fan? Uh, yeah. And maybe maybe you can tell the uh, the story about the binarian name for for people to uh, understand and see what what the connection there is. Yeah, so I, I think uh, kind of when in, this must have been 2015 or so when there was the need for a, an optimizer for Wasm, so I ended up calling it binarian because it kind of takes binary and or converts to binary. But it, but also notice that it's the sort of end binary n y e n sounded kind of similar to the names from Game of Thrones characters, so I felt there was maybe the the way to pr pronounce the names could be based on that or something. So there's a joke in the binary FAQ about the name being there. But but to be fully honest, I, I I'm pretty sure I. Just the name was just binary and convert to binary, and then I just noticed the Game of Thrones connection. <laughs> and, and I was at the time that if this was must have been around season three or four of Game of Thrones, which I think was kind of at the peak of the show, and so I was a huge fan back then. <laughs> well, that's one of the fun facts that you learn when you work with uh, with Alan. Um, cool. So, and the second question is um, the local get global set question. So, again, this is Vasm, but not. So, the background of the question is: if there is anything that you could um, locally get from you and globally set onto the world, what would it be? So, as an example, um, what would be for me something that I would local get and global set? It would be that I would finally get rid of the line break requirements of 80 characters. So I know why it's there. I know why it's been there historically. But like, I would just make every code style just abandon it and say, yeah, use whatever makes sense or don't don't enforce any uh, line break at all, line break requirements at all. Um, is there anything that you would local get global set? Or if you want, you can also flip it so you can say if there's anything um, you could global get and local set. So something that everyone in a sense of like at least a fair amount of people do, um, but you don't, what would it be? Yeah, you know, what, one thing that comes to mind is something that I try to do. I don't do it maybe per perfectly, but when I put up a demo of a WASM application or something, I always check that I've minified and optimized the code properly. And I feel that half the time when I see a cool link on social media to some WebAssembly or JavaScript for that matter demo, I, maybe it's just me, but I always go into the dev tools and I look at the source and I sometimes download the WASM. And often these files are just not optimized. Uh, so it always strikes me as a little funny that someone's showing, hey, you can run this application in, in WASM. Look how fast it starts up. But if they'd optimized it, it would have started up twice as fast. Anyway, so if, if everyone optimized their WASM files, that, that would be great. I could definitely get behind that. And um, it, it's reflected everywhere. So people go crazy about whatever. The startup time of a service worker, and then they have this massive JPEG or massive animated GIF. <laughs> so I'm trolling a mass uh, animated GIF. Um, and, um, yeah, so people are just 
focusing sometimes on the wrong things. And um, yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, so shipping unoptimized WebAssembly is probably something that you should not be doing. Cool. So thank you so much for being on the show. Um, thanks for being my very first guest. Um, as I said, this is a monthly podcast, will be a monthly podcast. So if you are active in the world of WebAssembly, if you want to be one of the guests, um, reach out to me. Um, you will find me on social media. If you just, just search for my name, Thomas Steiner, um, Google. Um, I'm Tom Ayak on Twitter, Mastodon, GitHub, everywhere. So um, I have a pretty unique name as well. So you will find me, reach out, um, be my guest in the future show. And um, yeah, thank you so, so much for being my first guest again. And um, with that, hear you next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye.